Erewhon presents several key concepts which upon a closer examination are found to be highly important in the study of Frank Herbert's Dune series, either as direct extrapolations or as major influences. Individually, one may look at these influences on Frank Herbert as perhaps a respectful nod from one author to another, but collectively, and through Herbert's acknowledgement to Samuel Butler in naming his Butlerian Jihad after him, on second glance we realise there is a greater importance to these concepts. In total there are five key ideas developed and explored by Frank Herbert from Erewhon, and are as follows. 1. The Unborn and their Plaguing of the Erewhonians. 2. The Existence of a Collective Unconscious or Racial Memory. 3. Prescience as an Evolutionary Trait Developed Through Natural Selection. 4. The Evolution of Machines to a Level, Singularity, where human beings are subjugated and no longer the dominant species. 5. To a lesser extent, messianism and the origin of religious systems. Note, this is more through this subject being explored by Samuel Butler in the sequel to Erewhon, Erewhon Revisited. The Unborn, Preborn, and the Collective Unconscious. The nature of the unborn in Erewhon is uncannily similar to that of the preborn in Dune. In Erewhon, in the chapters entitled Birth Formulae, The World of the Unborn, and What They Mean by It. The unborn are the children of the Erewhonians who live on unknown planets in what is described as a pre-existent state. The way the unborn come into the world in Butler's topsy-turvy country is by the constant plaguing of potential parents from their pre-existent state, giving them no peace either of mind or body until they have consented to take them under their protection, the result of which is being born as their child. Once ready to be born, they then take a potion which removes their memories and identities before committing a form of suicide which then brings them into the world. The inhabitants see their children in the light of their concocted myth of the pre-born as a terrible imposition, and it is as part of this tradition that they have what they call birth formula drawn up a document signed on behalf of the child at birth. This document is presented at a solemn and melancholy occasion some days after the child's birth, and states that the child takes all responsibility for being born, as it had plagued the parents to come into this world from a state where it had previously been altogether happy and looked after. These chapters represent one of Butler's typical inversions, in this case of the happiness upon the occasion of a new birth, and illustrate effectively the discontentment and unhappiness in his own childhood, though again here his work is more touched with cynical humour than being an outright attack on his own family. That would come with the eventual posthumous publication of The Way of All Flesh. It is however meant to be a strong enough indictment on Victorian family values. The nature of pre-existence in Erewhon corresponds to Butler's ideas of a collective unconscious, which show the beginnings of his doubts regarding Darwin's theory of natural selection as occurring by chance. It is a concept that predates those ideas Jung put forward in relation to the archetypes of collective unconscious, an area of psychology that interested Frank Herbert in his studies and would account for one of Dune's other major themes, the catastrophic hero. In Dune, the preborn are those children exposed to the water of life while still in the womb of a Bene Gesserit, as she goes through the spice agony to become a reverend mother. The water of life is a poison taken from the bile of the newborn worms of Arrakis, which the Bene Gesserit sisters must change at a molecular level upon drinking, with failure bringing death. This is known as the spice agony, and those that survive it become full reverend mothers, opening up the abilities of other memory to the Bene Gesserit, who are then able to look into their genetic past, through all the women in history who have come before them. The preborn are also known as abominations, for more often than not they go insane, inheriting the same abilities as a full reverend mother along with full consciousness while still in the womb. The insanity comes from the constant plaguing of the different personalities contained within the female other memory, who all struggle for prominence and attention. A fully trained reverend mother is able to control the myriad of personalities within her, but the preborn have little experience to save them, 
often losing their minds to either one dominant personality or else to the entire multitude. In the Dune series, this happens to Paul's sister Alia, who is eventually driven insane before finally committing suicide in Children of Dune. Paul's twin children are also pre-born due to the vast amounts of melange their mother is forced to take during her pregnancy to counteract the effects of a contraceptive poison. They are however spared the madness which consumes their aunt, albeit both being under the same pressures that other memory brought, and which ultimately caused her insanity. Leto II in particular eventually allows the personality of Harum to come to the fore in order to help him control the multitude, but what makes him able to deal with this better than Alia is not made clear. It is perhaps the strength that he gains from his symbiosis with the sand trout that makes him the ultimate predator that allows him to survive this. The Unborn and Erewhon are a primordial collective unconscious separated from the Erewhonians and are fundamentally connected to their views of reproduction. It raises the question of the Unborn being a kind of mass delusion, but the fact that they are from another world, and hence alien, does not bother the Erewhonians who are themselves the end product of the Unborn's desire to enter the world of Erewhon. The Unborn's plaguing of the Erewhonians as a multitude seeking to be born is an obvious comparison to the pre-born of the Bene Gesserit gender oriented other memory in Herbert's Dune series. The multitude of personalities of the female line that the Bene Gesserit experience vie for attention and re-emergence through contact with the host personality of the Reverend Mother. The Bene Gesserit only experienced this after having had the training and wisdom of many years before going through the test of drinking the poisonous water of life. A fully trained Reverend Mother, who has passed this test, then has access to this multitude and is capable of bringing forward either a single personality or a selection of the collective whole, known as Simuflo, in order to access their memories and experiences. The race memory, or other memory, or collective unconscious that is accessed by the Bene Gesserit is gender specific, only providing access to the female ancestry of the human species. This then is the real purpose of the Kwisatz Haderach breeding program, to create a male Bene Gesserit who is capable of accessing the memories and experiences of the male ancestry of the human species. Problems unforeseen arise in accessing this racial memory in two key aspects. First of all, the Kwisatz Haderach is seemingly able to access all genetic memories and experiences following the ingestion and transmutation of the water of life. However, in addition to accessing the pre-existing and subconsciously hidden racial memory, the additional side effect of near or total prescience is observed in such an individual. The second unforeseen problem arises when a Bene Gesserit takes the water of life whilst pregnant. This causes the fetus to enter the state known as preborn, where the collective unconscious available to the Bene Gesserit immediately becomes accessible to the unborn child, bringing the fetus to full awareness in the womb. This happens to Alia, Paul's sister, when Jessica undergoes the ritual. The Bene Gesserit forbids this under normal circumstances, referring to such a child as an abomination. Such children are often feared because of their unnatural maturity and knowledge. In addition, the experience of having the multitude of other memory at such a young age often results in madness and death. Interestingly, and despite the differences in other memory available to the Bene Gesserit, female, and the Kwisatz Haderach, predominantly male, Herbert shows Alia's growing insanity due to the clamouring of the multitude within her conscious mind turning to a male aspect within other memory. This is of course her maternal grandfather, the villainous Baron Vladimir Harkonnen. This is not really explained by Frank Herbert in Dune Messiah or Children of Dune, but it could be suggestive that as part of the same generation of the Bene Gesserit breeding program, and having the same parents as Paul, that Alia is at least a potential Kwisatz Haderach, despite being female. Herbert viewed Alia together with Paul as a representation of the Janus aspect, one looking forward, one looking back, as well as a representation of the Jungian archetype of the Syzygy, 
Here, Herbert has Paul looking forward into the future using prescience and is fully conscious of time and space, whereas Alia is the direct antithesis that looks backward through other memory. This slowly but eventually subverts her own personality, both consciously and subconsciously, to the point where the Baron is able to undertake action by controlling her body. Alia continues to expose herself to large doses of melange in order to increase her prescient abilities, which are similar to Paul's, but significantly inferior. This continued exposure to large doses of melange continues to exaggerate her ever increasing fragile state, leading her to rely on the personality of the Baron Harkonnen to not just help her control the multitude in her other memory, but also to help her in the real conscious world, giving her advice and guiding her actions in the intrigues of Moadib's court. Herbert having the Baron as the dominant personality in her mind is difficult to explain in the Dune series, as there should only be female personalities within Alia. The seemingly obvious explanation that Herbert leaves us to ponder is that the Baron Harkonnen is most likely a manifestation of Alia's growing insanity, and not a product of other memory after all. It also gives Frank Herbert an excuse to bring back an interesting character that he had killed off in Dune, having done something similar with Duncan Idaho, who also proved to be very popular in the first novel. Leto II and Ganema are also born preborn, and have the similar multitudes within their memories. Again, both characters represent the archetype of the syzygy amongst others, see chapter 3. But Herbert does not really explore how Ganema is able to maintain her sanity. Instead, the focus of how this is managed centres on Leto II. Both of the twins are able to hide the fact that they are abominations, but this is through deceit on their part. They are seemingly able to exhibit a level of control over the multitude, but as Leto II goes through his slow transformation into the God Emperor, he reveals that he has chosen one dominant individual personality from within the multitude to suppress all the other voices clamouring for attention. This is the personality of Harum, the Egyptian pharaoh. The collective unconscious, as perceived by Samuel Butler, is different from the representations of Jungian archetypes and as indicated earlier, is largely to do with the author's attitudes to Darwinian evolutionary theory. Herbert successfully blends the two concepts, most notably in the character of Alia, whom he uses to explore the nature of a collective unconscious and racial memory. In addition, Alia is in herself a study of an individual in the messianic complex, and as such represents a number of archetypes of the Jungian collective unconscious at different parts of the first Dune trilogy. These include the Virgin, the Harlot, one half of the Syzygy, the Heroine, the Mother, the Child and the Hierophant. Alia is not the only character used by Herbert to explore these concepts with Paul, Jessica, Leto II, Ganema and most of the Bene Gesserit characters exploring racial memory in some form or another. The Bene Tleilaks also explore this, but directly through genetic manipulation with the final incarnation of Duncan Idaho, perhaps representing the ultimate combination of these ideas, where his other memory becomes a personal one based on his various incarnations over thousands of years. The Nature of Time and Prescience Samuel Butler also notably comments on the nature of time in the chapter The World of the Unborn, and presents us with an interesting evolutionary quandary. In the back to front nature of the Erewhonians, we discover that they perceive time and life's place therein as moving backwards. Butler's narrator, Higgs, discovers the existence of a pre erewhonian race of men that died out long before the present society came into place. He is shown a text on the mythology presented to him by one of the Professors of Unreason. Before discovering the Erewhonian attitude to the unborn, he comes across an entry on a previous race of man that existed according to their myths before the Erewhonians. The entry is as follows. Sometimes, again, they say that there was a race of men tried upon the earth once, who knew the future better than the past, but they died in a twelvemonth from the misery which their knowledge caused them. And if any were to be born too prescient now, 
he would be culled out by natural selection before he had time to transmit so peace-destroying a faculty to his descendants. Similarly, prescience is very much a problem for those who possess it in the Dune series, from the guild steersmen and navigators who use a limited form of prescience to help navigate their ships through space, to the almost ubiquitous and stifling prescience that is experienced by Paul and his son Leto II. It is an inversion in itself that Frank Herbert presents the idea of prescience as an almost accidental side effect of the creation of a superhuman who is supposed to be able to see into the collective unconscious of the male genetic line's race memory. Those Atreides males that possess this ability in the Dune series also have the gift of prescience, with Leto II almost having complete prescience. The nature of their controlled evolution through artificial selection almost suggests that it is with the Kwisatz Sadarach that humanity has reached almost a Teilhardian Omega point. This is not actually the case as we discover in Heretics of Dune when the character of Miles Tegg, an Atreides descendant and product of a renewed Bene Gesserit breeding program, evolves the nature of the Kwisatz Sadarach even further when undergoing torture. It is in fact because of the apparent apex of human evolution which creates the tyrant god Emperor Leto II that factions within the worlds of the Imperium begin to advance forbidden technologies. This in turn creates machines that are capable of hiding from someone so powerful they can see every action anyone is going to take before it occurs to them. The end point of evolution, regardless of what path it takes in human development, is surely to ultimately create the equivalent of a living god, like the race of prescient men in Erewhon who die out with the sheer misery that their foreknowledge brings them, both Paul and Leto II learn very swiftly that complete prescience is indeed a curse, if not an evolutionary dead end, leaving them virtually no joy or surprise in life. The desire to escape this and become a normal man is the major motivating force behind Paul's abandonment of the Golden Path. The revelation of a Tleilaxu Kwisatz Haderach by Skytail in Dune Messiah is notably reminiscent of the prescient beings from Butler's pre erewhonian race of men. In discussion with his fellow conspirators, the Princess Irulan asks the face dancer how the Bene Tleilax overcame their Kwisatz Haderach. A creature who has spent his life creating one particular representation of his selfdom will die rather than become the antithesis of that representation, Skytail said. I do not understand, Edric ventured. He killed himself, the Reverend Mother growled. The Kwisatz Sadarach has a dominating control over time and space, and we note one of the appellations applied to this term refers to someone who can be in many places at once. The use of prescience by both Paul and later Leto II, in combination with other memory, gives them a sense of the possibilities and probabilities of future history, together with an all-encompassing knowledge of the past. This has led some to comment that the character of Paul Atreides and his messianic prescience is a response to the character of Harry Seldon and his psychohistory in Isaac Asimov's original Foundation trilogy. In that sense, Leto II may also be viewed as a response to the character of the Mule from Foundation and Empire and Second Foundation. In Donald E. Palumbo's discussion of Chaos Theory in the Dune series, he notes that James Gunn suggests Herbert's Dune is a critique of the Foundation trilogy, and subsequently Prelude to Foundation is a response to Dune, though this is from the perspective of an ecological and political viewpoint, which I shall discuss further in Chapter 4. Herbert did not acknowledge any direct response to Asimov's Foundation trilogy, although there are a number of interesting parallels and dichotomies. Asimov's Foundation trilogy owes many of its attributes to Edward Gibbon's The History and the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, as similarly does Herbert's Dune, though it can also seem to be influenced greatly by T. E. Lawrence's Seven Pillars of Wisdom, as well as Butler's Erewhon. Both series feature a number of similarities, from their huge expanse of empires, the use of introductory historical documents, and characters who work to alter the future of mankind. In the Foundation trilogy, the use of psychohistory by its inventor Harry Seldon 
and his fellow scientists, is put into place to preserve humanity and its knowledge as its vast interstellar empire goes into a predicted long decline. Psychohistory then is a combination of statistics, mathematics and historical observations used to make almost completely accurate future predictions. In Foundation, Asimov describes psychohistory as that branch of mathematics which deals with the reactions of human conglomerates to fixed social and economic stimuli. Within this definition, there are two provisions applied in order for psychohistory to work, namely, that the human conglomerate being dealt with is sufficiently large for valid statistical treatment, and that the human conglomerate be itself unaware of psychohistory analysis in order that its reaction be truly random. Herbert's Paul Atreides seeks to prevent a cataclysmic event through the use of his prescience, which offers up a number of future possibilities, many of which culminate in the destruction of humanity. It is only through one particular route into the future provided for by his prescience, called the Golden Path, that mankind is able to survive this universal apocalypse. From Paul's point of view, this is a hard thing indeed, for it is essentially a route that means crushing much of humanity to ensure that those who emerge from the tyranny of the Atreides Empire are strong enough to survive. This forms the basis of an imposed order of natural selection that goes beyond social Darwinism, and as such, Paul is unable to bring himself to complete the task, abandoning the Golden Path. It is only through Leto II, who abandons much of his humanity to become the God Emperor, that the Golden Path is taken up again. As Palumbo notes, Asimov's meta series champions a chaos to order perspective in its desire to bring about the re emergence of empire after a period of stagnation and rot. Frank Herbert's Dune series champions an order to chaos perspective in that the Atreides following the Golden Path must destabilize and scatter their own empire in order for humanity to survive the apocalyptic scenario their prescience predicts. Palumbo's insightful work establishes the use of reoccurring chaos theory motifs throughout the Dune series as an accompaniment to the development of Herbert's theme of ecology, in that dynamic systems produce feedback loops that either maintain the status quo or destabilise and change the pre-existing systems. The reversal of these feedbacks is seen by Palumbo inherently in the fact that Paul and Leto II embody positive or destabilising feedback. Comparing Paul to the mule, he notes the following. Like the mule, Paul is a mutation who shifted the old balance and amplified disorder. And so is Leto II, who Paul calls the ultimate feedback on which our species depends, and who enforces a rigid order expressly to provoke chaos. It is through this observation that we have the dichotomies presented between the two characters. Both mutants, Paul and Leto II, are our dangerous heroes seeking to bring chaos out of order so that in turn they can save humanity. They will be hated and despised for it, but their intentions and motivations, ultimately difficult, are inevitably viewed by the reader with the benefit of hindsight as praiseworthy. This is ultimately a paradoxical viewpoint of these heroes when we consider Frank Herbert's attitude that such men are destructive to society. The mule however is a villain who rules by the aid of his mutation, an ability to mentally coerce anyone, and brings chaos to the desired effect of order, the goal of the prediction of psychohistory and Harry Seldon's foundation. Differences aside from these two great science fiction masterpieces, it is with interest that inherently within their similarities, the association with chaos theory as a fundamental part of the nature of human systems, whether they be historical, political or ecological, is what sets them apart. Frank Herbert's Dune series is seen as importantly anticipating the development of chaos theory, especially in relation to ecological science. Donald E. Palumbo looks at various aspects of chaos motifs in the Dune series and the Foundation series, but especially so when examining Dune's themes of ecology and the destructive hero that incorporates Joseph Campbell's monomyth. As mutations and the end results of millennia-long breeding programs, 
the characters of Paul and Leto II can also be seen as feedback loops when viewed as part of evolution as a dynamic system. Hence the prescient mutations of Herbert's universe deal with the chaos of balancing the golden path. Additionally, Herbert, according to Palumbo, complements this with interlacing the architecture of the Dune series itself with recurring fractal patterns, something he also sees as part of Joseph Campbell's monomyth. In dealing with the chaos that the evolutionary advanced stability of prescience creates in the hands of Paul and Leto II, Herbert has taken another idea from Butler's Erewhon and developed it with great skill. Herbert, in showing us two characters who are able to deal with the curse that prescience brings, together with its terrible responsibility and stagnation, shows us an example of what is fundamental to science fiction literature, the what if, and does so by extrapolating this brief segment in Butler's Erewhon about the first race that inhabited his topsy-turvy world.